Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome along to the Event Industry News Podcast. My name is James Dixon and uh, welcome to today's guest on our second uh, live broadcast going out via the Event Industry News Facebook page. Joining the podcast after an absence that can only be described as too long is Kevin Jackson. Kevin, good afternoon to you. Hi James, how are you? Very well, thank you. Great to have you back on the podcast. As I said, it, it has been far too long since we've had you uh, as a guest on here. Um, for those of you who uh, have not met or, or come across Kevin in your event industry adventures so far, um, I always struggle to introduce you, Kevin, but I will say uh, Kevin is the founder of Experience is the Marketing, um, who are a specialist consultancy helping brands and businesses grow and uh, develop their people, their brands, their activities, their events, but you're also involved in an awful lot of other things, Kevin, uh, yeah. which we will talk about today. Um, I suppose just to put a bit of context and a little bit of order to today's proceedings, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the uh, sessions that Kevin delivers all across the world, uh, looking at events, looking at business growth. We're also going to be talking about his new book, There's No Such Thing as Sales, and also um, a fantastic series, I suppose, or connected events that uh, Kevin owns and helps to run, um, which begins with the Muslim Lifestyle Show, which has already taken place this year and uh, was completed, I think, just a couple of weeks ago, Kevin. Well, it was last weekend. It was this weekend. Okay, so weekend it's a great, great place to start. So this yeah. was the third year of the Muslim Lifestyle Show, am I correct? Yeah, it's the third year of the Muslim Lifestyle Show, which is at Olympia, um, and we had... 20,000 visitors over two days, Saturday and Sunday. Right. And uh, so, two, so two days, did it begin three years ago as a two-day event? Was it a one-day event? Or was no, it, it was a two-day event. Uh, okay. It was always planned as a two-day event. Um, but what's grown is our ability to connect with the community or to be embraced by the community. And also um, how we've developed the event year on year. We sort of knew where we were going. We, we had a five-year plan uh, when we created the event, uh, and it was to help the community itself uh, trade better within the community, but also to help the, commun the Muslim community trade with, let's call them Western businesses. Sure. And th this, is, this is a show that, that, that you own, that you saw the opportunity to, to, to launch and, and establish. Um, mm. Was that something that came to you very, very easily or was mm -hmm. there a, a, a long run up and a period of, of preparation and research in order to decide, yes, this is, this is definitely warrants a place in the, in the event market? Yeah. I, 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 when I, so I went from Jack Morton to George P. Johnson. So I went from huge to huger. Mm. Uh, and I guess I was a realist in as much as when you leave an organization like that, the water closes over your head as if you were never there. Mm. And actually part of your skill is to be within that structure that is massively supportive. Yes, they want great people, but also the, the structure of the businesses are great anyway. And it, when you leave a business like that, the, I thought, we, I was going to say everyone, but I thought, okay, well, I've been great over there, I thought, but am I great without them? And I looked at things I could do and get involved in. I was... I was keen to stay in events and I was keen to uh, create an event or be part of an event that I owned because um, I think that's a different dynamic than spending clients' money. And I looked at different groups. I looked at strange and wonderful things. I looked at label making, which is a giant industry. I looked at hobby crafts, sewing, that sort of thing. And then I started looking at special interest groups. Then I m m uh, met religious groups. And I suppose my, my curiosity was piqued with Muslims because they're, they're not a homogenous group, but they're defined by their Muslimness, their religion, before they're defined by anything else. So as you know, they're, they're from Turkey, they're from Malaysia, they're from the UK, they're from Pakistan, they're from Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Oman. Mm. But they're all called Muslims. And that I thought was really weird. Not weird in a bad way, but just a strange way of naming a group. And what I, what I found as I dug, in, dug into it is there's such a rich lifestyle. What, I, what we wanted to do with my partner, who is a Muslim, is to bring that lifestyle to the world. So in my shorthand, it's food, fashion, finance, travel. 
and then everything in between there's jewelry and honey and art and craft but the main pillars around that food fashion finance travel um the muslim lifestyle show was born three years ago at olympia uh, we've just done the third one and out of that came the halal food festival which happens in uh, tobacco dock in august august bank holiday mm-hmm. which usually get gets around um, 17, 18,000. The Muslim Lifestyle Show gets around 20. We haven't got the numbers for this year yet. Okay. Around 20,000 over two days. And then we're doing this year the Eid Festival in Westfield in uh, Shepherd's Bush, uh, 21, 22 of June, uh, which is another iteration of a, a part of the Muslim Lifestyle. And, and all of these uh, are interconnected, but um, I, I suppose ultimately you're serving what is a, a very big marketplace. If we're looking at this simply from a, from a business point of view, for, for, forget the, 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 the moral implications or the moral aspect of, of doing something and, and what we talked about, about the group being defined by its religion before anything else. What you have here actually is a very, very rich business opportunity that capitalizes on, on, on a significant marketplace within our culture now. Yeah, I think as well. So uh, my partner, Wally Jahangir, says all the time, and I always take the mickey out of him, commerce breaks down barriers and money doesn't have any colour. So in setting off on the journey, we were, I think you first got to seek to serve the community that you're building the event for and then worry about the money later. As anyone in the events industry knows, three years in the life of event is very short but we've got to a place now where everyone knows we're stable everyone knows we're going to be back next year everyone understands what what we stand for and for this year the first year ever we had sponsorship from western brands we've some of our vendors have done deals with western brands it's starting to move a needle that was a bit stuck and it's i don't don't, I suppose when, when walking around the show this weekend, there almost wasn't one exhibitor that I didn't know personally mm. that didn't come up and shake my hand and pat me on the back. And it was, it's always the same for Walid because he knows all of them. Mm. But it, it's, re- it, it's so different to be embraced by a community like that, to understand the different personalities and just understand what, what it means to be Muslim. Not that I understand everything, but I understand more than most, I think. Absolutely. Going back to what you said at the start of this episode about um, having worked for those major organisations before going it alone, if you, if you want to call it that. Um, how, how exciting and challenging was it for you to, to, to decide, I'm going to actually launch my own show that I'm going to own, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is, and I'm actually going to be able to put into practice all of these things that I've been mm-hmm. advocating for clients for many, many years now and actually show that everything I've said to them really does work. How how exciting a prospect was that for you going back to the first year of the event? It's uh, for the first time ever, and for those that know me, they'll realise, for the first time ever, I felt um, not under pressure, but a responsibility for delivering. Mm -hmm. Because I'd... Uh, embedded myself in the Muslim community for this thing with uh, with my partner as I said it was a different sort of pressure at Jack Morton at George P Johnson I'd been a cheerleader for them as businesses but also for the industry yeah and I'd spoken on stages around the world for them but also for the industry to let people understand the power of experience marketing or the power of events or the power of that one-to-one community engagement And as you say, I'd been spouting that for a long time and I'd been successful doing it, both for Jack Morton and George P. Johnson. And then it was, do I really know as much as I think I do? Can I really do the things that I say I can do? Can I make the things that I believe in come to life? Because it's only, as as I still say in most of my presentations, it doesn't matter what you say. It only matters what you do. You can promise anything but it's what you deliver. And I think that's the power of the event industry. Advertising and PR, they promise stuff. They say stuff. We have to do stuff. We have to open the doors, lift the curtain, open the event, and the industry has to come together and collaborate across groups and companies and uh, national boundaries and uh, 
diverse groups coming together to deliver an event. And that's a huge thing. And I've been talking about that for, uh, I suppose, Jack Morton and George P. Johnson it must have been 12 years of my life. Yeah. I've been talking about that and practicing this speech and embedding that, those concepts in my head and thinking about the future and understanding where, and then I had the opportunity to do it, which is exactly what we're doing. And, and going to that phrase, if we can call it that experience is the marketing <laughs> something that, that I suppose in some respects, if you don't mind me saying this, it has become almost synonymous with, with, with yourself. You know, when I see that, I, I, I think of you. Um, <laughs> I wanted when, it to be. When, when, the the idea. when the curtain went up on that first show, yeah. bearing in mind that exact set of words experience is the marketing yep. and knowing that you've got this long-term plan to establish this show did you find yourself more so than ever on that show floor looking at things in even more detail than you'd ever done before making sure that the experience in that opening year was as good as it can be even down to refining things on the day of the show once it got live itself to make sure that people were leaving with that experience i think we'd had such an Yes and no. We'd had such uh, a great team around us and we talked long and hard about what and how it should look. Um, and I think that by the time we'd got to the day of the event, I was very confident it would be doing the right thing for the community that we're serving. Mm. You know, the experience of the marketing was a phrase I create. I mean, it must be 12 years old. It really must be. I've been saying it for a long time. Because 90% of the people, 90% of customers believe the experience they have rather than the 10% that believe the advertising PR. Hmm. They believe the experience of what happens when they go into retail, what happens when they pick up the, call, the phone to the call center, what happens when they go to the website, what happens when they get the product home, what happens at an event that represents a brand. That's all experience. And that's what people, customers, audiences, believe and that's what they talk about they don't talk about the advertising anymore there used to be those great water cooler moments where we all got around uh, uh, um, at uh, 10 o'clock on a monday morning and talked about the adverts we'd seen yeah or well, some of us did the nescafe nescafe adverts and those long stories that doesn't happen anymore and if you look at great advertising now it's usually filming an experience it and is all of those old flash mobby type things those experience those customer experiences you know uh i think it's little that's doing those great parties where they create a dinner party or a christmas party and they put the food in and then they say it's lit that's filming an experience that's people believing firsthand those people in the at the dinner but also secondhand because you look at those people and you know they represent you you know mm -hmm. they're not advertising people you know they're real customers so that's the power of the experience and the experience is the marketing is true of everything whether you're going to a gig whether you're buying the great apple products and taking them home or whether you're going to an event people believe the experience that they have and that's what that's what they selfie about that's what they're taking pictures about the experience absolutely and i think maybe in terms of giving examples of things like that when you were explaining that to us just then you know i'm thinking of something like a a, a mobile phone company you know that would spend millions and millions of pounds on, on fancy advertising but if you have a problem with the network or you have a problem with your device or whatever it may have a problem with your bill and you phone up and you get lousy customer service or you're kept on hold for hours and hours and you have a bad experience what that also does is next time you see their fancy expensive adverts crop up on tv advocating an amazing service it actually has an even more of a negative effect because they're not paying attention to that experience and, and actually what it does is when you see that ad you comment on it to the people around you and you pass on your experience of the brand to those people mm -hmm. they become you so they now have had that experience and I, I don't know if you saw but the survey came out for the mobile phone industry uh, today or yesterday yeah, yesterday yes yeah and uh, the one we know the biggest and the one we know best is actually at the bottom for yeah. customer service it was rated the worst and their advertising is now detrimental to that because everyone is saying customer service the experience isn't working yeah yeah and it, it, as soon as it crops up on telly or on the internet 
or on the radio, the first response that people that, that a lot of people now give, as you said, is 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 a negative one. It's a yeah, no, no not for me. Um, so I, I understand exactly um, what's happening there. And I, I'm I'm keen to sort of look, but beyond that, uh, the, the Muslim lifestyle show that's taking place at Olympia, you have these other connected events, as you mentioned. You have the Halal Food Festival, but you also have the um, the, the E Festival, festival at, uh, uh, which you said Westfield. is going to take place at Westfield. Um, I'm curious to know how that, in what respect that differs from the other ones, because when we think of Tobacco Dock and Olympia, they are what I would suppose you would call quote unquote traditional event spaces. Something like Westfield um, is a, a massive shopping centre. So how is that particular event going to differ in terms of what people will see and experience when they go along to it? What, 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 uh, what we've done is we've created the Muslim Lifestyle Show and out of that has come uh, the Halal Food Festival, which is now uh, going into tobacco, which has been in tobacco dock for three years. And then as we developed, what what we went to Westfield with was was a plan to show them a new community or to show them how to bring the community, a bigger part of that community, into their stores. And the, the event at uh, Westfield, there's a giant event space at, at Westfield wow. uh, where they do brand activations. And uh, I know uh, Samsung, have done, Jack Morton and Samsung have done lots of stuff in Westfield. Uh, and Sony have done sp stuff there, but we're creating a, a, a modest fashion show. We, we have a, a modest fashion live brand, uh, which is around uh, the designers. So the, at the heart of the show is, is fashion. And then there's um, activations going on around that. Excellent. If you're just joining us on today's podcast, uh, Kevin Jackson is uh, is talking to us about um, all sorts of different things. We've been discussing the Muslim Lifestyle Show, uh, the Halal Food Festival and the Eid Festival that uh, Kevin owns and, and operates. And uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of other things as well on today's episode. Um, one of which is a new book that, uh, that has been published that, that Kevin has put together called There's No Such Thing As Sales. I'm curious to know... Who, is this your own particular opinion on things, Kevin, or is this a, an amalgamation of a number no. of different things? <laughs> no, not really. Well, it, it started off as a. Um, it started off as uh, my opinion because I think eight years ago I started saying all purchases were emotional. Um, mm. I, I'd done some brief research because you know what PowerPoint presentations are like. I'd done some re brief research. And the amygdala at the back of the brain, which is sometimes called the prehistoric brain, sometimes called the reptile brain, is responsible for our behavior. It's the bit that said, run, fight, eat it. It's going to kill you, run away from it. It's that bit. It doesn't have language, doesn't have logic, but it dictates behavior. And when you say, I have a gut feel about something, that's what's talking to you. It's the prehistoric brain. So I've been saying that for a while and I thought, as I was writing the book, I thought I'd better find out if, if that's true. <laughs> I'm sure it was true, but I, I, I thought I should. Because I think um, people think there's a process you can go through with sales. And then if you start at A and finish at Z, you're going you're gonna to close every time. And that's just not how it works. Yeah. And many people tuning in today and, 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 and who are familiar with, with this may have seen over the years the step-by-step -step guide to getting a sale, you know, people who may not have worked in the event industry all their life and have worked in other jobs and sales driven sectors have seen the sheets of paper with the start at point A and end at point F and you will have a sale. Yeah. And you won't. There is no way. It's a bit like hypnotism. You can't sell to someone who doesn't want to be sold to. You can't hypnotize someone who want, doesn't want to be hypnotized. Mm. And what, in researching the book, what happened, I, I, I found some really learned paper. It took me a while to write, but I found some learned papers. There was one by Dr. Oliver Sacks, who people may remember was played by Robert. De he's just passed away, actually. Uh, may remember he's played by Robert De Niro in the film Awakenings, eminent psychologist. And he describes a scenario in one of these books because what we're, re what we're understanding in psychology uh, is that our body is driving our brain mm. so uh he describes a scenario where you walk in and i'm sorry if this is scaring people you walk into a room and you find your best friend dead on the floor 
and this isn't real so it's just an, it's just the mind example. anybody tuning in this is hypothetical <laughs> yes yeah, right your best friend isn't really dead on the floor um and your eyes see dots so the dots become lines and the lines become images and that goes up your octal nerve into your brain in the meantime before any of that has happened your body is already pumping adrenaline and your eyes are already filled with tears so your body is telling your brain how to behave mm. and it's the same when people say and i'm sure everyone's heard the quote you make up your mind whether you like someone in one third of a second that's not your brain talking that's your body that's your physicality telling you we humans are 200,000 years in development this thing 200,000 years in development you can't get away from that you can't get away from it it still dictates our behavior so when people talk about sales what they really should be talking about is relationships you don't buy from a stranger ever 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 you buy the thing you want to buy because you feel emotionally connected to. Yes, in a B2B context, you've got to have logic. You've got to have features and benefits. You've got to go through that. And if you know, some people say to me, oh, but what about buying shoes? That's not emotion. That's not a relationship. But if you're buying from a brand, you know, that's a relationship because brands are like people. Mm -hmm. They have certain traits that you believe in, Coca-Cola, Cisco, whoever. That's the relationship. So you've got the relationship. Now it's about the emotional purchase. Do you want this pair of shoes? Do you want this event? Do you want this computer? Do you want this network? All of those things are emotional decisions that are driven by our prehistoric programming. And, and is the book, your, your, your background and, and, and where you work predominantly is in the events industry, but given there are so many sectors where sales is is relevant is the book specifically targeted at the event industry or is it written for anybody that deals with this it's definitely not written for the events industry. <laughs> it's written it's written for everybody it's uh it's written for every industry because it's the same story and um i suppose i wrote it because i've spent a long time doing sales especially in the event industry and people think you've got to have the gift of the gab and you've got to be smarmy, you've got to be... It's not that at all. Everyone can sell because everyone is passionate about something. And what you have to find is where your relationships are and sell through passion, sell through knowledge, which is all I've ever done. And it's those connections that last and they last forever because that emotional thing drives business. And you can instantly and truly see through somebody who is not totally convinced by what it is that they're peddling can't you yeah. if, if somebody's trying to sell you something and their heart is not in it you will people will feed off of that yeah and that and you know I, I suppose the example for everyone in the events industry you've all lost pitches that you thought you were going to win you've all won pitches you thought you were going to lose that does as, as random as that seems it doesn't happen by accident it happens by relationship. It happens by something happening in the room that suddenly people think that I've got it. And, you know, we all fight against incumbent agencies. Incumbent agencies win more pitches than they lose with their incumbent clients because the client knows them. The client trusts them. The client understands if you miss something in a pitch. Actually, they didn't say that, but we know they do that. Mm. You know, there are, there's so much emotion in those things that you've really got to work hard at building relationships and that's the key to anyone's business growth. You know, as I say in, uh, in my presentations now, business growth comes from personal growth. Hmm. You can't sell tomorrow based on what you knew today because as a really ridiculous across the board example, you tell everyone you've got a website. So you say, have you seen our website? And they say, yes. It takes between eight and 12 contacts to sell something in a B2B context, roughly. 80% of all sales are made between the eighth and the 12th. How many more times can you say, have you seen our website? Have you seen our price list? You've got to say something new. And sales and relationships are about adding value to people's lives. So now you've got to understand what value you could add. So you've got to know something about the person. Mm. They've got to know something about you. You've got to understand what value you could add and then offer that. And the, the eight to 12 things is 
it's obvious you need a relationship. It's obvious you're never going to sell anything to someone on the first try because that's not how it works. People don't buy from people they don't trust and people don't trust people they don't know. We have a negative bias. You know, we are, two, I keep saying this because it's important, 200,000 years in development, right, we've got a negative bias. So we used to look behind a bush and say, is that a dinosaur, a lion, someone's going to kill me, okay, I don't trust it. We, we say no more than we say yes. So when you're pitching and when you're trying to sell, people are already negatively biased towards you. How do you break that down? Relationship. How do you break that down? There are six or seven things you can do, but relationship, adding value, authority, consensus, there are lots and lots of things, and they're all going to be in the book, but it all starts with relationship. This is clearly something that you're very passionate about. How, how long was the idea um, uh, brewing to actually put it down on paper and get the book published? It, was this a very, very long-term project and something that has been a sort of slow burner for you? No, no not really. Uh, I mean, it, it, it probably took uh, eight, nine months to do, but as I said, unfortunately, I'm... A, I'm, I'm a, only constrained by my own ideas. So one of the one of the things in the art of persuasion um, is consistency. If you're trying to sell to someone and they've made a public statement and your thing supports that public statement, they have to be consistent with their own beliefs, right? Or yeah, my consistency is I've said for the last ten or twelve years, it's not what you say, it's what you do. So you can say anything you want. You can say you're writing a book, but until you've written a book, you can't really, you haven't done anything. And my belief in sales as a force for good, okay, we need ideas, but nothing happens. No commerce happens until a, a, a thing is sold. No one earns any money. There is no benefit to anyone. So sales is very important and people shy away from it thinking it's difficult or there's a trick to it or it's, You've got to have, you've got to have kissed the Blarney stone and all those things that people say, you've got to be able to schmooze people down the pub. It's not like that. It's really not like that. It's about every single relationship you have with every single person you have. They're all different. You know, you might go playing sport with one group. You might go drinking with another group. You might go and see opera with another group. You have different friends who have different interests and that's business. Mm. You will have different in business friends, if we can call them that, who will have different interests. And it's about finding a way. You know, relationships are difficult, right? Your, your partner relationship, boy, boy, girl, girl, whatever, boy and girl. It's about adding value to that person's life. And if you start from that principle in sales, you will always be successful. If you start with the principle of I want to build a relationship, not I want to close business, because that is not the way to do it. I'm curious. Uh, uh at risk of sounding like an insufferable bore, um, I'm asking the Never, GDPR, James. I'm asking the GDPR question an awful lot at the moment, and and for good reason because it is something that is highly relevant to our industry. Wait, 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 wait. Well, there we go. There's the reaction that I wanted. <laughs> I don't find GDPR a bore at all. I find it um, liberating. Well, this, th 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 let, let, let me put this to you then, and th this sure. is why I brought up the subject, because it, it, uh, on the very word liberation, uh, <laughs> the, the fact that people will have less data, inevitably, the way I'm seeing things at the moment uh, and the way that I've speak, been speaking to certain companies about how their auditing is going and how their processes are going in, uh, ahead of the 25th of May and having to re-verify all the data that they've got and get those opt-ins, what it appears will happen is that people will end up after 25th of May with less data that they can absolutely use. so they will have less fewer options to just blanket bomb absolutely. emails out there throw enough proverbial and hope that some of it sticks which means that they will have to pay attention to an ethos like this which is going back to building relationships not just clicking go on an email every day and hoping that they might get some results back uh, so it's all in the book but I was lucky enough to be in a room and I can't even remember how long ago it was. If I said 30 years, that would probably 20, somewhere, somewhere in there. When uh, Henry Ford, the third, maybe, mm -hmm. said, in the future, everyone will have a database of one. 
And everyone in the room went, huh? We want millions. We were, they just didn't understand the concept. And he was so far ahead of his time. Everyone wants to be treated as an individual. And what we are consistently doing, and I, I can come back to data and Facebook and all that in a minute, what we are consistently doing is trying to group people together. We don't want to be grouped together. And the great thing about GDPR is all of those people that we've never talked to, all of those sales lists of people that are never going to buy anything, that are never going to sponsor anything, that are never going to attend an event, we're going to get rid of them. And um, all those thousands of names we've got stored on spreadsheets all over the place are going to get down to 100. And we're going to realize those 100 people have been providing our living for the last five years, <laughs> not the 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. It's those 100. And what we have to realize is those people need value. So what are we going to do to help them get value? Not just attend the event. What are we going to do to help them get value? How are we going to add value to their lives? How are we going to focus on them? How are we going to understand them? And I, I, I've been talking about GDPR, I think, for a year. Part, I'm part of Event Huddle. I chair the Event Huddle, which is meets a monthly, it's a monthly meeting. Uh, and I think we've done GDPR twice. Mm -hmm. Not sure, but it's on the Event Huddle website. And I said back then that... GDPR is probably the best thing for sales and marketing that has happened for a very, very long time. Do you think it will um, knock some of the complacency? Do you think people have become complacent with, with the way that they market because of the prevalence of data and how much data has been generated? <laughs> so I've been talking about data and big data for probably two years. Uh, we've always had big data. In the event industry, we've always had big data. You'd go to the motor show, you'd fill in a form uh, on a stand. At the end of the show, the manufacturer, whoever they were, did what everyone did and throw all that crap away because they just didn't know what to do with it. And if you talk to Google now, they say it's not about the data, it's about the insight. And it's always been about the insight. Of course, the five biggest companies in the world, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and uh, Apple, that's what they talk about, big data, because they want big data. They want to know stuff about us. They want to be able to mark. But who else has got time to do analytics like that or write algorithms like that? We have to work from, as we always have in marketing, as we always have in communication, we have to work from insight. So what does that group say? And what's the insight that's going to connect them with the story we're telling? How do we make that connection? That's what events do. So understanding what that group wants and finding a way of creating an insight that drives the event is what we've always done. We don't need big data. We need insight. Uh, uh, sort of moving that, that subject on a little bit, uh, as somebody who travels the, the world talking about not just this subject, but lots yeah. of things relevant to the event industry. How are the wider world seeing this subject? Because GDPR will impact people outside of the European Union. Of course it will. Because if they are targeting or marketing or emailing people within the EU, they have to be compliant. So it will be relevant to companies in America, in South America, yeah. in Southeast Asia, in uh, the Pacific regions. How are they... How, how well aware are they of this subject? And is it going to prompt what you're hoping it will prompt on a wider scale, not just in Europe? So they're very aware. And of course, it will prompt a lot of stuff in terms of the list that we do. But it will also help us as consumers, because we're both sellers and buyers, it will help us as consumers regain control of our data. You know, the... the the right to be forgotten, the right to be unsubscribed, sometimes it's just really difficult. And what we're, what, what's happening in that big wrestling match is the consumer is back in control. We are back. The, the humans are back in control. You know, it, so there's a number of things in here. So, you know, the, the whole Facebook thing I've been talking about for, I don't know, three or four years, because if you look back at history, so uh, Isaac Newton's third law of motion, for every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. Indeed. It's a universal law, right? Yes? Yeah. I, I remember it from A-level physics. Right. So if you look at the financial crash of 2007 was an action, right? Yeah. The reaction was we realized that was missing information. 
people weren't telling us the truth. People were leaving out things. It doesn't matter whether you're in the finance industry or whether you're a government. We realized that actually there was something not exactly right with that relationship. Mm -hmm. So what we decided to do, we decided to stop listening and believing that and trust our friends and family. As you do. Yeah. Who, do you, who can I trust? I can trust my friends and family. But what we really needed was to know more friends and family. So the growth, the explosion in social media, 2008, 2009, when we needed more friends and family to trust. Everyone was our friend. We friended everyone. And we could grow four, 500 people, 5,000 people because we needed more friends. But of course, we gave up certain rights. So the action was, so the action was financial crash. The reaction was social media. Now, social media, growth and power, data. Now we've realized that that isn't exactly right because Facebook is a bit like you going into your local coffee shop and the guy behind the counter saying to you and your friend, look, I'm going to give you free coffee for the life, for life, forever. All I would like is for me to sit at your table with you and take a few notes. Is that all right with you? And you say, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. And that's Facebook. You are getting something for free, something amazing for free, but it's not free. The trade is your data. Do you mm -hmm. want to give that? Do you want free coffee for life? And are you happy for this guy to sit at your table taking notes about where, you, where you've been and what you've done? So the reaction is, we've written, that was always going to happen. This has just been an, uh, 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 an excuse. It's always going to happen. And what we've realized, a bit like those GDPR databases, the Facebook thing, we don't need to know 500 people because yeah. we don't talk to them. We need to know 10 or 20. We need to know those people because they drive our business and they drive our relationships. We don't need everyone. And that react action reaction thing is happening all the time. You know, I'm, 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 I'm in the middle of this presentation at the moment and which I love because it's all black and white, but I, I don't talk, but I flick up a slide that says, how are you? Mm. And before anyone has an answer, I flick up a next slide that says busy. Right. And the next slide says very busy. And the next slide says busier than everyone. <laughs> And certainly busier than you, because that's what everyone says. When you say, how are you? They say busy. Well, busy isn't how are you? It's what you are and what you are. You're making a choice. But if you take, so I love laws, right? I love natural laws. So Pareto's law, Pareto's principle, Vilfredo Pareto, an Italian yeah. guy, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 80, 20, the 80, 20 rule, 20% 20 of your effort gives you 80% of your output. Yeah. 20% of your effort gives you 80% of your output. 20% of your customers give you 80% of the business. 20% of your workers do 80% of the work. 20% of the people in a bar drink 80% of the, right? It's that. It's a repeating thing. But what people don't know about that is fractal, a repeating formula. So 20% of your 20% gives you 80% of your 80%. And 20% of that 20% gives you 80% of that 80%. And when you keep doing that sum, you end up with 4% of your effort gives you 64% of your output. 4% of, of your effort gives you 64% of your output. Right. And what I say to everyone is, what is your vital 4%? What is the 4% that is driving your business? Because that's the thing you need to do more of. Of course, we've got to do 100% and some of it's going to be wasted and some of it's chatting and some of it's, you know, I get it. But 4% is vital. But does everyone know what their 4% is? And actually, if you are busy, what the hell are you doing? Because 4% is 64%. <laughs> Tell me, where can people get hold of the book? It's not out yet. Okay. I think, I'm not sure where it is. Uh, I think it's next month. So. Right. But I will, uh, it, it'll be everywhere. You won't miss it. <laughs> Unfortunately, you won't miss it. Will it be a hard copy and digital download? Yeah. 
Yeah, well. Okay, well, uh, rest, rest assured, event industry news will be all over that as soon as it's <laughs> out. So uh, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll have some links um, which we can add into this particular video post on eventindustrynews.com. And I'm sure that uh, we'll have some other information related to that when, uh, when the publishing date gets set and uh, we can let people know how they get hold of that. Um, going back to some of the stuff that we were talking about at the beginning of today's podcast, before we wrap up uh, the episode, Kevin, if people want to find out more about some of the shows and events, that you're involved in them um, tell us about how they can do that um just go to the website so uh muslim www.muslim lifestyle show uh halal food festival eat festival they're all on they're all out there there's uh at muslim lifestyle show at halal food festival they're all on twitter instagram they make amazing pictures all the various feeds. And one thing that I should clarify that I didn't do earlier on, so forgive me, is um, which particular Westfield is it? Is it Stratford or West London? West. London, West London. London as they call it. So Shepherd's Bush. Excellent. Well, um, as I said, we, we've rattled through all sorts today, and it's been a bit, been a you know, a, a bit of a, a mixed bag on the podcast today. Um, but uh, if anybody does but want that's to... that's like life. That ex- life is, is a mixed bag, James. It's exactly like life. If anybody does want to get in touch with Kevin, um, just search for experience is the marketing. Um, you'll find Kevin's website. And if anybody wants to get in touch with him uh, directly, I'm sure you would be uh, more than happy for anybody to reach out if they've got any other questions and things that they would like to speak to you about uh, personally. Yeah. I'm all over everything. So Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, hit me up on Twitter, uh, Instagram. It's always, uh, uh, sorry, on uh, LinkedIn. Um, I'm around everywhere. Come and see me speak. <laughs> fantastic the uh, the event industry news podcast itself is brought to you by our own sponsor engage powered by d2i systems winner of best event management platform at the 2017 event technology awards to learn how engage can make your business more profitable visit d2i systems.com forward slash engage um unfortunately we're out of time kevin it's no. been great having you back on the podcast again um we mustn't leave it this length of time before we get you on again to find out what's happening in your world um as i said if anybody wants to get in touch with kevin we've given you the details to do so if anybody wants to get in touch with us eventindustrynews.com at event news blog is the twitter handle and if you go on all the other social media platforms and search for event industry news it won't take you long to track us down I'm certain of it. Kevin, thanks very much for joining the podcast today once again. Thanks very much Pleasure. to everybody for tuning in and we will see everybody on the uh, the next episode of the podcast. Goodbye to you all. Bye.